here to introduce Gloria, Dr. Gloria Dodd, who is a lecturer and researcher of the Marion Library, the International Marion Research Institute in Dayton, member of the uh, Mariological Society of America. So we were together May 21st when Father Peter received the award from the Mariological Society. And he gave a magnificent 15-minute summary of why the Franciscan approach appeals to him. And uh, he's not forcing anyone to follow it. It's just the, the logic of why it appeals. Uh, and I think we picked that up and uh, all day long today. It's right there. So uh, I'm just, without further ado, please, Gloria. Thank you, Father. Um, today, I thought I would address the question of whether Mary's co-redemption and mediation are clearly understood. And so before and after the Second Vatican Council, Catholic theologians have vigorously disputed the meaning of Mary's co-redemption and mediation. So in tribute to Father Fellner's love for Latin, his scholastic method, and his sense of humor, some answers to the following speculative question illustrate how Marian concepts can be easily misunderstood in our modern world. What car would Mary drive if she lived today? A typical Mariologist might take a scriptural approach to hold that Mary would drive a Fiat, of course. <laughs> <laughs> With the upcoming Jubilee of Mercy, others could think that Our Lady of Mercy would surely drive a Mercedes. <laughs> However, a Scotist might note that as the perpetual virgin, first in the perfect redemption, and the a priori condition for creation and redemption. The most fitting car that Mary could drive, should drive, and therefore would drive, <laughs> is indeed a Prius. <laughs> so while these jokes are amusing, they also point to the confusion that exists about what some Marian doctrines actually mean. So as just one part of this collaborative series, um, I gratefully set aside the Marian topics covered so well by others specifically um, and focus myself just on Father Peter Damien's contribution to the post-Vatican II discussion of Mary's co-redemption and mediation. In 1997, a pontifical theological commission of 23 theologians responded to the request for the dogmatic definition of Mary as co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, and advocate of the people of God with a declaration that called for clarification of these ambiguous terms a remembrance of history, further study, and ecumenical sensitivity. After this declaration, Father Fellner helped to organize 10 international symposia from 2000 to 2009 to study Marian co-redemption. Usually chairing the event, presenting papers at these meetings, and then publishing the papers in a series, Mary at the Foot of the Cross. While Father Fellner advocated the dogmatic definition of Mary as co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, and advocate of the people of God, he also humbly acknowledged his role as a theologian, not a papal advisor. As he said, and I quote, we are not here to pressure the Pope or to tell him how or how not to conduct his affairs. That is for our Lord and Our Lady to do, not for me, not for you, and I insist, not for critics of co-redemption either. <laughs> 
Thus, this paper will focus simply on Father Fellner's understanding of the truth of the Marian doctrine of co-redemption and mediation as given in those 10 international conferences. This paper, in his honor, will use a scholastic style to synthesize the objections Father noted, as well as his explanation of the doctrines, before setting forth his responses to the objections. And the conclusion will provide some evaluation of his ideas. So what's wrong with calling Mary co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces? Father Fellner acknowledged a variety of objections that he liked to describe by quoting G.K. Chesterton's Marian poem, A Party Question. Quote, when in the midst of all the din of controversy, with rights and wrongs on all sides, there was heard the mocking and demeaning of the Virgin Mother Mild. At that moment, one distinctly began to hear the little hiss that only comes from hell. <laughs> So these challenges are presented in the chronological order in which Father Fellner first identified them in his 10 conferences. So objection one, Christ alone is the redeemer and mediator. Calling Mary co-redemptrix and mediatrix confuses the role that belongs to Christ alone with the role that others might have by participating in it. Objection two, a redeemed person cannot also be involved in redeeming. Objection three, the title co-redemptix is ambiguous. Therefore, it needs to be substituted by another. Objection four, the biblical patristic foundations for the doctrine of the co-redemption are lacking, so we should not promote it. Objection five. The ecclesial typical approach to Mary in Vatican II excluded the terms co-redemptrix and mediatrix of all graces as theological and semantic anachronisms. Objection six. All ecclesiotypical approaches to Marian co-redemption entail Mary's passivity. So in the uh, Christ's action in the redemption on the cross. Objection seven. Mary is neither directly nor immediately actively involved in the dynamism of the sacramental order or of the single sacraments, nor can she be because she is not a priest. Objection eight, Mary's mediation is mere intercession. Objection nine, the argument in favor of Mary's co-redemption is only abstract, quote, unrelated to theological reality, unquote. Objection 10. A modern culture of contentment and self-gratification does not value sacrifice. Father Fellner appealed to authority, hmm. and we can guess already what some of them are. As he would say, on the contrary, Genesis 3.15 presented the Father's joint predestination of the Redeemer and his mother in one and the same degree, decree. St. Francis called Mary the spouse of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin made church. St. Bonaventure taught that the price of our redemption Mary brought forth into the world, uh, paid and possesses. And that Mary is, quote, our mediatrix with Christ 
as Christ is our mediator with the Father. Blessed John Duns Scotus taught that the preservatively redeemed immaculate conception can actively cooperate in the redemption of all others who are liberated from sin. Cardinal John Henry Newman noted the foundation of theology on the patristic Eve-Mary typology. St. Maximilian Kolbe named Mary to be the uncreated Immaculate Conception. Pope Paul VI said that no one is Christ-like except to the degree that he is first Mary-like. And Pope St. John Paul II taught Mary's maternal mediation in Redemptoris Mater. And Benedict XVI explained the Marian principle of the church. Now, Father Fellner's concept of Mary as the maternal mediatrix. So as they would say, I answer that. First, let us distinguish between salvation and redemption. Salvation from non-existence and for eternal happiness comes from the absolute primacy of Christ and the Immaculate Conception, meaning that God created the world with the intention of the Son's incarnation and the creation of Mary for the sake of a loving union with man. However, since the original sin was foreseen, the incarnation also is redemptive, meaning that it freed humanity from sin so that all could be saved. Now let us distinguish then between two types of redemption, preservative and liberative. Christ redeemed Mary in the most perfect way by preserving her from sin as the immaculate conception, which is qualitatively different from liberative redemption, whereby Christ redeemed everyone else by freeing them from sin. Mary's redemption is also qualitatively different from liberative redemption because she was then also preserved from ever committing a personal sin. Yet, as a redeemed person, Mary is a member of the church. As a creature and a human being, Mary is dependent on and subordinate to God, her creator, and specifically Christ, her redeemer. Now, preservatively redeemed, as the spouse of the Holy Spirit, that is the Immaculate Conception, Mary's cooperation has been unique. As the mother of the church, she cooperates actively in the objective, liberative redemption of all others. Her cooperation began by becoming the Virgin Mother of God and continued at the foot of the cross where she sacrificed her maternal rights in Christ's sacrifice that reaches all people in the subjective redemption. Through each and every Mass, that is the re-presentation of the sacrifice on the cross and of her spiritual maternity. The united action of Jesus and Mary in the objective redemption began when the Redeemer took the form of a slave, Philippians 2, verses 4 to 10, in the womb of the handmaid, or slave of the Lord. Mary's cooperation was immediate in the Incarnation and established her in the order of the hypostatic union. Mary cooperated immediately through Christ's life, helping him 
as shown by her actions at the Annunciation, the Nativity, the Circumcision, the Presentation, the Flight into Egypt, the Loss and Finding in the Temple, Cana, and culminating with her compassion with Christ at Calvary. And at the foot of the cross, Mary was Christ's immediate, visible source of support. Thus, Mary's cooperation is unique for several reasons. As the Immaculate Conception, she is the only one so completely united to the Holy Spirit that whenever he acts, she does also. And thus, she is able to cooperate actively and directly, immediately, in the objective redemption. Secondly, Mary's active cooperation also functions as a type, that is, the very form and empowerment for all others to cooperate as well in the subjective redemption. And as such, um, Mary's cooperation is described as personal as well as instrumental. So in summary, the Immaculate Conception, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, is the first principle of Mariology. As the Immaculate Conception, she is also the maternal mediatrix, that is a general category taken from Blessed John Duns Scotus. She is the co-head of the church. And Mary's maternal mediation is realized in three moments, as St. Bonaventure would say. First, as the mother of God. Secondly, as the co-redemptrix with a co-redemptive offering and being offered, culminating on Calvary, her spiritual maternity. And thirdly, as she, since she possesses all graces, she is the distributrix of all graces in the church that can also be called mediatrix of all graces, especially in the Eucharist. Each of these moments are causally related. The co-redemption is a consequence of the divine eternity. And then mediatrix of all graces, or mother of the church, is a result of her divine maternity and her co-redemption. And so Father's uh, perspective can be taken to his replies for the objections. In reply to objection one, Solus Christus. He appeals to scripture. St. Paul describes Christians as co-redeemers, filling up what is lacking to the passion of Christ in the church. Colossians 1.24. Mary's mediation as mother is both chronologically and logically prior as the precondition for Christ's existence as the one mediator. In the reversal of the fall in which Eve came from Adam alone, Mary is the solitary human parent, the virgin earth from which the new Adam is formed while remaining his helpmate or bride, although not physical wife. Mary's maternal mediation as the new Eve, the mother of all the living, is then required for all others to have spiritual life as part of the body of Christ by being conformed to her obedient reception of Christ, that is, being Marianized by a total consecration to Mary. This Christ alone objection would be valid if there were only a liberative redemption. However, as the Immaculate Conception, the uniquely preservatively redeemed Mary can participate in the liberative redemption of all others. Therefore, just as the Mary's divine maternity manifests the divinity of her son, 
profession of faith in the co-redemption does not detract from, but enables us to affirm the one mediation of Jesus. It is Christ's perfect mediation that graced her as the immaculate daughter of the Father, spouse of the Holy Spirit, enabling her to become the virgin mother of the Son. Thus, the title, co-redemptrix, expresses her distinction and her derivation from the mediator-redeemer, a dependence that neither adds nor detracts from the dignity of the first in actively <coughs> contributing. Cardinal John Henry Newman taught the chronolatry, the worship of the moment, and the satisfaction and gratification that this moment brings is the underlying basis for this Christ alone objection. Because the refusal to acknowledge Mary's intercession also rejects the Pope's authority as well as the sacraments. And without those secondary causes, one becomes <coughs> their own arbiter of truth and enters into a sea of doubt and anxiety of conscience. The logical consequence of the solus Christus premise would exclude the possibility of any creature's free cooperation in the redemption, such as the divine maternity. Therefore, Mary's free cooperation in the incarnation is sufficient to refute the principle of Christus Solus. Reply to objection two. No one can redeem himself. Mary did not merit her own preservative redemption that came from the merits of Christ alone. However, she did help Christ in the liberative redemption of all others. So this Thomistic objection simply needed a further distinction provided by a Scotistic perspective. Father Fellner advocated using both soteriologies since the Thomistic approach provided the idea of a single mystical person of Christ within which Mary's distinctive role is explained by Scotus. The reply to objection three the ambiguity of co-redemptrix. Father's answer. The uneducated find it difficult to understand any theological term, <laughs> any philosophical phrase, even the most ordinary, even the most fundamental. Our modern culture is also so pragmatic that anything that is not available to the physical senses does not even enter the mind. Thus, rather than change the terminology, teach the audience. So that although there have been a multitude of titles to express the truth of the doctrine, quote, there is no better title to express exactly what this mystery is all about than co-redemptrix, unquote. Quite precisely, because a mystery is beyond a complete human understanding. There is no word in our language that can fully express any theological mystery, such as trinity, hypostatic union, soteriology. Therefore, since Catholic theology does not hesitate to use these terms, Catholic theologians should not fear using co-redemptrix. Reply to objection four, a lack of biblical patristic foundations for Mary's co-redemption. The Greek fathers of the fifth and the sixth century teach us that Mary is so far superior to us that we can compare ourselves to her, but not the other way around. Reply to objection five, the pre-Vatican II anachronism. 
our faith is first of all a matter of humble faith in the tradition received, not an adjustment to current intellectual or cultural fashion. Rather than Mary either related to the church or to Christ, Father held for a both and, just as the title of the chapter 8 of Lumen Gentium indicates, the Blessed Virgin in the mystery of Christ and of the church. Or in Bonaventurian terms, the Blessed Virgin as mother of the whole Christ, head and body, and this from the first moment of the incarnation ever after. Thus, to resolve a post-Vatican II objection, use an ecclesiotypical approach. For example, the Pauline and patristic concept of co-redeemers in the church rests on an interpretation of Mary co-redemptrix as a type of the church, primarily as a dynamic mother rather than a static model. Mary's co-redemption and mediation establishes the very possibility of the church's spousal union with Christ and any possibility of attaining justice and cooperating in the work of salvation and justification. Thus, while Vatican II did not make the solemn definition of the co-redemption and universal mediation of Mary, the structure and presentation of Lumen Gentium presupposed precisely that traditional Franciscan thesis, the mystery of Mary in Christ and in the church, and the underlying assumptions pointing to the co-redemption remain in place. The hermeneutic of continuity between pre- and post-Vatican II doctrine is exemplified by Paul VI, Mater Ecclesiae, and his encyclical, Marialis Cultus, that supports Mary's spiritual maternity in regard to the entire body of Christ. John Paul II and Benedict XVI's teaching on the Marian principle of the church explain Mary's maternal mediation in the distribution of grace. Reply to Objection 6. The ecclesial typical approach denies Mary's active role. While subordinate to Christ and a member of the church, Mary's role is uniquely preeminent and active in Christ's redemption because she alone is the mother of God and therefore the mother of the church. Her maternal causality is not only physical but also meritorious and moral as a type that first forms and then incorporates us into the church and into her form that is, best called personal. Reply to Objection 7, Sacramental. Mary's, object, uh, Mary's involvement in the sacraments has been recognized in the most ancient canons in the Mass in all rites. And Mary's reception of Holy Communion is an aspect of her mediation whereby we are able to take advantage of this great sacrament and achieve full incorporation into the body which she conceived virginally and first received into herself at that virginal conception. And that mediation, therefore, is in some way truly sacerdotal. Reply to Objection 8 mere intercession. Mary's active and dynamic mediation or presence in the church is much more than just intercession. 
She alone is the Immaculate Conception and co-redemptrix jointly predestined with Christ and actively involved with Christ in the triumph of the cross. Her mediation is a moral cause that is voluntary, personal, and dynamic. In its inseparability from Christ, her mediation affects each and every member of the church. Reply to Objection 9, only abstract. Christ as the mediator who is of Mary, with Mary, and for Mary. As mother of the mediator, Mary is a concrete reality for Jesus. And with Jesus, Mary is our spiritual mother and is a practical reality for us as well. Reply to Objection 10. Cultural Rejection. A life of self-gratification and contentment is a disguised pantheistic egoism that is not true happiness. Those who live the doctrine of co-redemption reform their lives and their secular culture in a Marian way so as to become a genuine civilization of love and finds the joy that all desire. An evaluation of Father Fellner's contributions regarding Marian mediation and co-redemption. Father Fellner is a human being. And as such, there is room for some improvement in his approach. <laughs> so pardon my boldness, but I would, I would venture to say that his very brilliance lends itself to some academic problems. Sometimes he referred to something without citing it, perhaps considering it to be common knowledge, when it might not be. <laughs> And occasionally, the common knowledge might be incorrect. At other times, his succinct statements leap from premise to conclusion, perhaps because the intervening steps are obvious to him when they might not be to the reader. <laughs> it was confusing to find the term mediation used for both the overarching category of Mary's threefold cooperation and redemption, as well as for the third moment of her cooperation. But even with such flaws that verify his humanity, his contribution to Mariology remains admirable. He consistently used a hermeneutic of continuity. He rejected the false dichotomy between the past and the present doctrine of the church, a separation that Father Fellner noted was proposed by both schismatic and avant-garde theologians. He integrated Christ's teachings from scripture to those given by Christ's current vicar on earth. He found support for Mary's co-redemption in unusual scripture passages such as the virgin earth of Genesis and the doulos of Philippians 2. He used the teachings of Vatican II, Paul VI, John Paul II to provide ecclesiotypical answers to modern objections. In particular, his insight into the necessity of the anthropological basis for mediation is most helpful. The model of mediation is not legal, no, nor social, but a woman, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Until that is realized, the theological objections to Mary's mediation cannot be realized. And as a Franciscan, he integrated a scholastic theology from St. Francis, St. Bonaventure, Blessed John Duns Scotus, all the way to St. Maximilian Kolbe, presenting the Immaculate Conception as the fundamental principle. 
He also resolved a Thomistic objection to co-redemption by using a scotistic distinction of preservative and liberative redemption. And indeed, hopefully this brief overview is sufficient to inspire the listener to read more of his Marian writings and find some of the references for these. But most, really, I think most important is indeed is the, his confidence in Mary. As Father Fellner wrote, perhaps as a bit of a confession, the believer may well be initially irked by this kind of slick anti-Marianism circulated by Catholics, but on second thought we may smile. It is the hiss of desperation directed against the impregnable Tower of David about to crush still again with her heel, the head of the serpent liar, waiting for the blow. Thus, in the spirit that Father Fellner inspires, let us conclude by invoking her together. O Mary, Mary conceived, conceived without sin, sin pray, pray for, for us who have recourse to you. <laughs> Peter, do you wish to reply to Gloria? <laughs> no, I accept all her observations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great conversations in the composition. I'll have hey. the telephone to Gloria. What do you mean by all this confusion over the term mediation? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was important to have the, the, your qualifying adjectives. Mm. Where, so you had maternal mediation as the overarching <laughs> category, mm -hmm. and then the subcategory, you had three, divine maternity, mm -hmm. co-redemption, and then mediatrix mm -hmm. of all graces. Mm -hmm. And so finding mediatrix of all graces as the third moment, mm -hmm. and then also as maternal mediation as the overarching category, mm -hmm. without those qualifying adjectives, the repetition of the term was confusing. I was trying to figure mm -hmm. if really co-redemption was the main it's the one. Same, the so same, I, it's the same mystery. Mystery where they begin. It's all the mystery of Our Lady, and it has three moments. Also, but we're not dealing with simply directly with the logical categorization. It's useful, but actually the mediation is the woman's me me mediation, and it has the distinctive, some of which we participate and assist, the last one, and some of us which we are unable to assist in until the mystery is completed at that point. Right, right. And I think you yourself uh -huh. wrote it very beautifully. It's St. Bonaventure's perspective, so yeah. how, how he approached it. So as for a, myself, as long as I can't be right about it, it needs more, it more detailed ex explanation because you don't find St. Bonaventure and Scotus in the ordinary textbook. No, one Generally does not. speaking, mediation is re restricted to the third, ca third category, which of course is to can minimize considerably Our Lady. Years ago when I began doing some research and writing on this also in the four volumes that Dr. Miravalli put out. I followed Father Gabriele Roschini, who was a kind of pioneer of Mariology and founded the Marianum. And he would make this distinction that in a general sense, mediation is a description of the event of our redemption. So it's the broadest uh, topic because it has to do with the need for a mediator between God and, and sinners. And so he used that as an overarching topic, and then the secondary Marian mediation as a part of the global. So he used the term uh, mediation also as what we would call redemption, co-redemption. Mm -hmm. And he did make that distinction. Roschini was very careful about things like that. So he'd lay out his, uh, his uh, topic and then show you, and I did that in that first article, 
uh, on uh, Mary in the liturgy, that uh, mediation can be looked at as the, as the overarching discussion and then mediation of grace as a more specific dimension of it. Any of the old manuals of Roschini will have it. Uh, is the exception. And with it, with Are there the any other comments that we wish to make? Or we will take a few minute break and then we, we're going to have the Mass downstairs in Our Lady.